you brought your Bible today. Come on, it's church. I'm loving it. I'm excited. I'm, I'm pretty excited. I didn't get to preach last, last Sunday, so, you know, I feel like I've been out of pocket for a while. But would you take your Bible, and um, I'm going to have you turn over to a familiar scripture in Jeremiah 29. You probably know the one that I'm talking about and where I'm going to go. In Jeremiah chapter 29, you know, the heart of Christianity is, <clears throat> is a specific person, and his name is Jesus. You know, um, the church is not a building. This building, even though it was built as a chapel, um, is not the church. If you drive down the street, and when Nicole and I, when we were in Philadelphia, her father pastored a church. What was it? Highway Tabernacle in Philadelphia. And if you go there, it, the building is still there. It's still a church. It's still Highway Tabernacle. And it was an amazing building because it was this old, um, <clears throat> you know, cathedral looking. It's got this massive steeple that, you know, it's probably 50 feet. I mean, it was just, that, is that big? I don't know if 50 feet is. Is that big? Does it sound big? Should I go 100? It was huge. I mean, it went up, you know, several stories. And I was just looking at that steeple going, uh-uh. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be up there. wouldn't want to clean that. But that building, as beautiful as it was, that's not the church. Guess who the church is? You. Look around. These people that are here, this is the church. But it's not the church if Jesus is not there. This is not the church. If Jesus doesn't come in and his presence is not allowed to be there, that's not a church. Why? How can you say that? Because he's the head of the church. How can you have a church and the head not be there? Just a body. All right. So, so, we, uh, so we were traveling. We, we were in, oh my word, every state. We were in Pennsylvania and D.C. and Delaware and Virginia and New York and Maryland, and I don't know wherever else we were. And we were literally, you've seen that movie, Planes, Trains, Automobiles? We were in planes, trains, automobiles, and boats. We were at all, I mean, all the whole spectrum. So when we were getting ready to leave yesterday and fly out of Philadelphia, I was, I was paying attention to the plane and, you know, just how, it, you know, Philadelphia is a good size airport, and so there's all these different runways and, and all this stuff that the people have to navigate. Uh, up in the control tower, you know, planes, landing planes, especially when we, because we flew through Chicago. Well, you got a Chicago O'Hare, oh my word. There's a plane taking off every 30 seconds, I heard, in Chicago O'Hare. And so, it's, and so a pilot, before he takes off in a plane, he needs to know several things, right? What direction he's heading, he needs to know what runway to be on, what time to take off, and then he also needs to know what altitude he can fly at. So when we flew out of Philadelphia, you could see there was all this wind that was blowing and the grass, I mean, it was just, whoosh, and I mean, I was going, and the plane was even rocking. And they said, yeah, we're going to sit on the tarmac for a moment and allow this little storm to pass over and then we'll take off. And I, to me, it didn't seem like we waited there very long. <laughs> it was like, you know, another minute and a half and then we were taxing and I was like, oh, don't we need to wait a little longer, you know, because you can still see the wind and the plane, you know, it's rocking back and forth. And then when we took off, see everyone, all the pilots want to get to 30,000 feet. Why? Because that's your smooth ride up there, 30,000 feet, right? You get up to that level and man, it's just smooth sailing and everything calms down and you can have your ginger ale and your peanuts. I brought some uh, uh, pretzels, by the way. I was gonna give some to Dan and I think Spencer had some for you, some pretzels. So don't let me forget after service. Airplane pretzels, they're good, let me tell you. And uh, so, so anyway, so, so we, we take off and man, it's a bumpy ride. I mean, we, as soon as we take off, we're you know, you're bouncing around and you're getting up and I'm going, Lord, I can't wait to get to 30,000 feet. And then when we hit 30,000, man, it was just smooth sailing. Well, sometimes in our direction in our life, we want to get to 30,000 fast. But see, the control tower knows 
who's in your way, what planes are coming in, what the traffic looks like. And sometimes he'll say, no, you're going you're gonna to go up to 22,000. That's as high as I can let you fly. There's too much traffic up there. Or, you know, or he's going to keep you low for a while and then take you up to 30,000, right? And why? Because he can see what's going on. Well, God can see what's going on in your life. And even though sometimes we, wanna, we want to do something that God has called us to do, and we want it to be an exponential ascent to 30,000 30, right off of the bat. And God's saying, no, no, you don't know what I, want, what I need to intersect you with. You don't know why I need to keep you here so that I can take you and intersect you with this before you can go up. So don't get frustrated in that. And so I wanted to share some things um, with you on my heart. So if you're there in Jeremiah 29, look at verse 11. I'm going to read it to you out of the NIV. It says this, for I know the plans that I have for you. This is an interesting statement to me. I know the plans that I have for you. Because whose plans are they? They're his plans. They're God's plans. That didn't say, for I know the plans that Phil has for himself. He, they're his plans. And so it goes on to say, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. That's blessing. That's God wants you to prosper. He wants you to increase. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. So they're plans that are filled with a hopeful future. They're plans to prosper you, but they're his plans. What is my job as a Christian? When I got born again, what happened? I, I decided I'm going to take up my cross daily now and I'm going to follow Jesus. What does that mean? That means that my flesh is going to die. I'm going to die to self. I'm going to die to my plans, die to what it is that I want to do. And I'm going to take up the cross of what Jesus wants me to do, where he wants me to go, the people he wants me to talk to. Because God's going to put you in, in uncomfortable position, situations so that you can get comfortable in those situations. You know, you look at Zach. Now, Zach, is a, he's, real, he's real comfortable behind the mic. That was not always the case. When he was, how old was he the first time we put a mic in his hand? 12, 12 13, somewhere around there. Well, I remember we, because, yeah, out on the outreaches. And, and we threw a mic in his hand. And the first time he was like, well, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? I don't know what to do. He was very uncomfortable. It was very awkward. Well, sometimes when you begin to share with people, when you begin to pray with people, when you begin to witness to people, it's awkward, right? My cousin shared a meme I thought was pretty funny. He said, I'm determined not to be awkward today. And somebody says, hello, how are you? And he says, what was his response? It was funny. I got right into this and now I can't. Oh, what did he say? He said, he said, my dog is fine, or something. It was a real awkward response. And anyway, okay, you guys get it. I don't need to. Sorry, that was bomb. Okay, all right, so I want to share with you. Don't hold it against me, please. <laughs> but I want to share with you, I felt led to share with you this morning how to hear God's voice in direction. These are some things that I'm going to share with you that Nicole and I have used in, you know, just hearing the voice of God, knowing that this is Him talking to me because I want to head in his direction because in God's direction in his plan is where the blessing is that's where there's a hope and a future right and so I want to be on the page so I want to give you a few things if you're taking notes feel free to write these down so how to hear the voice of God number one is to esteem his word esteem his word you know, I heard a story about a minister that just wanted to hear, wanted God to speak to his heart. And he spent hours in prayer. And it was, it was constantly the same thing. God, I just, want, I just want to hear your voice. Speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. And he said, and nothing was happening. And finally, the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart. And he said, listen, I've already spoken to you in my word. If I want to say something additional to that, I will. But first, go to my word. Find out what my word has to say. This is huge. The word of God is the voice of God. That's his voice already talking to you right here in his word, right? And so if we esteem that, 
then that means that we esteem what he already said. Because sometimes we get in this track of looking for, I'm not going to go there yet. Just a minute. I'll come right back to that. So, so, so here's, here's the best way to read the Bible. I'll come right back to that. Here's the best way to read the Bible is to look for things that you can do in his word. Like, for instance, let's, let's say it has to do with your words. Let's say you have a background. You, you, you curse like a sailor. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. But, you know, let's say that that's the way you were. You, and you curse like a sailor. Well, you get born again and you go, man, you know what? I'm, I was reading in this Bible. And so you read the scripture where it talks about your words. And it talks about, you know, uh, settings, uh, uh, apples of gold and settings of silver that your, that your words can be something that blesses people that is refreshing to them and you learn what the bible says about words and then now you want to change it because of what the bible says not because i have to be perfect now that i'm a christian let's see it's a whole different dynamic it's us reading his word looking for things that we can practically do that we can apply to our life okay but here's where i was going to go before Sometimes people are too, they are, they are looking for the new revelation, for the exciting revelation, and so they blow right past the practical application that they need in their life. The simplicity of the Word of God. Because when you read it, it shows you, it reads you. You know, I shared a couple of weeks ago that I, I, had, I got upset over, at Nicole over something, and it was something stupid. My... Anybody else ever knew you don't have to raise your hand? <laughs> but I did. I got, I got upset over something. And then I read a scripture that talked about letting it go and not holding on to the offense and, and forgiving. And so I had to go to the kitchen and ask her to forgive me. I feel you should have known to do that anyway. Well, I needed a, I needed a reminder. So here's why the word of God matters. Think about this. Jeremiah 1 verse 12 says, that he is ready to perform his word. His word. Man, that's huge. So why do we read his word? What's the purpose in reading the Bible? It's so to hear God's voice, but also because it's what transforms our life. It's the word of God that transforms us. It's what we read and hear. See, because when we, when we get born again, when we surrender our life to God, that's a, that's a salvation experience. But now we need a transformation experience. And what changes, that what transforms our mind and our thoughts is the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, it changes how you think. You find out what God says. Well, I'll, give you, I'll give you, for instance, when you know what God says, you'll see red flags in, th- in things that are said because it doesn't line up with what this said. So that's transformation. So number one, esteem is word. Number two is go with the peace. Go with the peace. This is something that Nicole and I have, God has really helped us to make sure that what we're getting ready to do, do you have a peace about it? Do you feel good about it? Do I feel good about it? Then once we have that agreement, man, it's easy. It's easier to walk in that. Well, it, you feel it's just me. Well, that's okay. Your witness is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. He's the one that will check your heart. Have you ever done the nails on the chalkboard? I could have brought a chalkboard in here and gone, you know, that's kind of what my heart feels like when, when I'm about to make a decision about something that doesn't feel good. <laughs> we, we were in, the, where were we at? New York? No, we were, we were on our way to 76er game. We got to go to a 76er game, man. It was cool. It was a $14 ticket. I couldn't pass, you know, you can't pass that up. So, so we were on our way, and we're going down to the train to go to the 76er game. And as we're getting out to ready to get on the train, <laughs> This African-American guy says, hey, buddy. And, you know, <laughs> the only thing that could have made it worse was if he was wearing a trench coat. You know, <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> and he said, no, I got, I've got some train tickets for you. And actually, they're good for two rides. He said, I'll sell them to you for two bucks each. Well, it's $2.50 just to get a one-way. And I thought, that doesn't sound like a bad deal. And so we had some of Zach's friends with us, a guy from New York. And I said, well, you're from New York. What do you, what do you think about this deal? And he goes, I don't know. 
And so, anyway, we ventured in, we bought, I had a piece about it. And so I bought the tickets, and we went to the game, and we rode back. It was great. It worked out great. Huh? Somebody had, some of them had three on there? Man, that was a good deal. Better deal than I thought it was. Okay, so let's talk about go with the peace, okay? Think about a, think about a stop sign or, a, a, you know, a, a traffic light. Okay, so red's stop, right? In most states, red means stop. Um, green, obviously go. Everybody likes go. Yellow. Now, I know when it comes to traffic laws, yellow means to proceed with caution, right? But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose to you that in this situation, it means wait. It means wait. Too many people are too quick to step out on what they hope instead of what they know. And you don't want to step out on what you hope when it comes to, you know, a career change, when it comes to who you're going to marry, you know, when it comes to the next season of your life or making any kind of a decision. Don't you want to step out on what you know? Uh, I do. I want to step out on what I know. Isaiah, we talked a little bit where we prayed a little bit about this, about having joy. In Isaiah 55 verse 12, it says, you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. It's so interesting to me how many people don't have a joy, they don't have joy about where they're going. Sometimes they're not even really thinking about where they're going. They're just wanting to get out of where they are. And the way we leave a season is the way we enter the next season. If we leave angry, upset, discouraged over here, we need to deal with that before we step into our new season. We don't want to carry that right in to the next season, right? Because, you know, the saddest part about leaving where you are is that wherever you go, there you are. You're there. So the same mindset, same attitude. And Nicole and I have seen this. We've seen people leave jobs because they didn't like it where they were and they make a lateral move and then months later, they're not happy there either. Well, there's a problem here. And I'm thinking it's not the employer. (laughs) I'm thinking, okay. So, (laughs) but if you don't have joy, let me tell you, you're not being led by him. We should have joy where, where God has taken us, right? And then if you don't have peace, you can't be stressed out and say you have peace. It doesn't work that way. Peace is this, let me tell you, okay. So we got to go to a Philadelphia Eagle game. It was another thing we got to do on vacation. I was, that was pretty cool. I got, I got to be honest, that was really cool. Because we found out they were playing on Thursday. We were so disappointed because we were there over Sunday and we thought, oh, let's see if the Eagles are playing. And they weren't. They were away. They were playing away. And I went, oh, man, we're not going to get to go to football. Oh, well. And then we found out they're playing Thursday night. So this is Wednesday. We get our ticket. Okay. So we go, and guess who they're playing? They're playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And who quarterbacks for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Tom Brady. And so here's Brady come walking out, and he just is so casual. So not, here's a guy that's a pro that's been doing this for all these years, but people are booing him as he walks out. How would you like to be booed? Walk out. How would that make you feel? Boo, boo, you know? And I mean, so, but he comes out and what does he do? He, and people are booing him as, you know, as he comes out to play and they're yelling all kinds of stuff. And I know where I was seating, sitting, he wouldn't be able to hear any of the stuff that was happening around me. But but what does he do? He marches right down the field just with effortlessly and scores a touchdown. Just right. Why? He has a peace about who he is, why he's there, and what he's supposed to do. What's your peace meter look like? If we were to put that out. If I was to put the panic meter on there, I mean, what would it look like, you know, for you? Your peace on the inside of you. This is good. It's important to have peace. So turn over to Philippians chapter 4. I want to read another verse to you. Philippians chapter 4. And let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 says this, and out of the NIV, I'm going to read to you out of that translation again. But it says, do not be anxious about anything. (laughs) That sounds like a command. To me, what's it sound like to you? 
Do not be anxious about some things. No, he says everything, anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Man, this is so good because when you cast your care over on him, and, I, you know, one of the things that helps you cast care is when you know you're in his will. You know that you're doing what God wants you to do. You have a peace about it. You know in your heart, I'm in the place that I'm supposed to be. And so for me, it's so easy to cast care because paying for stuff that God called me to do, I have no stress about it. I have complete peace about it. Why? Because he asked me to do this. So if I can get that answered, am I in his will? Am I doing what he called me to do? Am I, am I in the position that God wants me to be today? If I'm there, then I, worrying about finances is no longer my responsibility. Philippians 4, verse 19, what does it say? And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches of glory by Christ Jesus. It's not according to my job, how hard I work, what I can produce. It's according to his riches. Man, that, that delivered me from, from worrying about needs. It did. It just set me free, that verse. That's a good verse. So don't be anxious. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be anxious. What are you doing that for? Number three, learn to discern his will. Learn to discern his will. We talked a little bit about the yellow light, right? So if you're not sure, wait. Let me say this. A good idea is not always a God idea. This is really important. There's a lot of good ideas out there. There's a lot of good ministries to be a part of, but it's not always God's purpose for you. Is it? We have to answer that question. Lord, do you want me to be a part of that? Where have you called me to be? One of the things that, that's important to Nicole and I at Vision Church in this ministry is that people feel that they're to be here because God, because they've prayed about it. Not because you're shopping for a church like you shop for an outfit. I don't like that jacket. I don't like those jeans. <laughs> I, you know, well, why are you allowing that to be what makes, causes you to make a decision? Isn't it supposed to be him? If I'm following God, wouldn't I check with him? Lord, where do you want me to go to church? That's, you guys missed a good place to say amen right there. I'm just still, I just want to say <laughs> so, so the next part of discerning, uh, learning to discern is to fast and pray. Fast and pray until you know. Again, don't step out on what you hope. Step out on what you know. And so in order to do this, you have to allocate time for this. Okay? This is not something that's just going to come uh, by osmosis. You know? I mean, it's not just something that you're going to have to you just set your Bible on your head and miraculously something's going to get in there. No, this is where you have to take time. And set aside a specific time. And, and put, always have a purpose to your fast. I, was, I think it was because we were on vacation and I was feeling bad. And I said, Lord, I'm going to fast these next two days. And it was the last two days of our vacation. And, yeah, and the Lord, the Lord said, why are you doing that? And he said, is it because you're feeling bad? Because of how you're eating I said absolutely and he said that's not a fast you want to go on <laughs> you don't have the right purpose in mind I'm just being honest with you I'm just being so man we ate good those last two days <laughs> I enjoyed it. Yeah, okay so key an important key to learning to discern his will is to be fully committed to his plan this is huge I can't go over this enough because that's the very foundation when you give your life to God and you've given all of it to him, then you've given him the right to tell you where to be, 
when to be, who to be with. And he will speak to your heart. I, like I said, I don't know how people that aren't saved make it in life. I don't know how they do it. Because you've got nobody helping you. Nobody like the Holy Spirit. Where am I supposed to be? And, well, Phil, what if I don't get an answer? Again, I go with the peace that I have. I ask God, God, what do you think about this? What if we do this? You know, I ask God for a warehouse to be able to do the giveaways that we're getting ready to do in bulk. <laughs> By the way, I'm so excited about it. But it wasn't the time. And God didn't answer me. Don't get offended when God doesn't answer you. Do you remember Jesus? Do you remember how many people came and asked Jesus questions? And he didn't even answer them? Remember? He didn't even answer them. What did he do? He, he went somewhere else. He started talking about something else. Or he asked them a question. Some of you didn't like that. <laughs> so, so don't get frustrated. He will speak to your heart. He will. He'll give you the right answer at the right time. But when he, shared, when he opened the door for us to be able to do this warehouse giveaway, I just said, God, thank you. Because I honestly thought it had died, that it was a dead dream. And here God brought it right back around. So, oh, and by the way, um, the, the Sunday before Halloween, what date is that? Next Sunday. Next Sunday. So next Sunday night, if you guys want to come to the worship night, it's Sunday night. It's going to be exciting because it's, it's not our worship team. It's a, it's a collective of different worship teams from around the city. And, but we're having it at the warehouse. We're going to do it that night at the warehouse. That way, all of you will be able to see the warehouse, see what God's vision is and what's going on. And I got a call while I was on vacation. We got another truckload coming. Yeah, yeah come on, Jesus. All right, number four. And uh, Rebecca, I'm going to ask you to come and help me. <clears throat> number four, enter his rest. This is an interesting part um, of hearing the voice of God. Enter his rest. Phil, what does that mean? Well, I, I encourage you to do this. Go back after you, know, after you get home or you have a moment. Go back and read Hebrews chapter 4. Because it talks to you and it shows you what his rest is. It talks to you all about his rest. But I want to read to you out of Hebrews chapter 3. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> it says this. Who, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses led out of Egypt? So this is the children of Israel that he's talking about. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see, and then he gives the answer why they were not in, able to enter into his rest. <clears throat> so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief. When you, when you look at the children of Israel, all the miracles that God did when he delivered them from Egypt, that should have been enough. Wouldn't it? To you? I mean, all these plagues that were not, that were not small miracles, they were, they were amazing. Nothing had ever been seen like that on the earth. And you'd think that that would settle every belief issue that any of the children of Israel could ever have, right? But what happens? They leave. Pharaoh and his army is behind them, chasing them, and they've got the Red Sea in front of them. What do they do? They lose all hope, all sense of reality, all sense of faith, I should say. All their faith goes out the window. Why? Because of the pressure of the moment. And what is entering his rest? Entering his rest is when you read the word, that you take it at face value and you just settle in your heart. That belongs to me. That's for me. Healing is for me. When I found healing, when I, when I read Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8, uh, verses 2 and 3, and it talks about that leper that came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And when Jesus put out his hand and touched a leper and said, I am willing, be clean. Hey, keep them up for a moment. I just want to see faces. But he said, be clean. 
And when he said that, that settled it for me. It's always God's will for me. Well, you know, Phil, sometimes people get healed when they go to heaven. Your spirit's not what needs healed. It's already been healed. When you receive Jesus, your spirit was healed. It's your physical body that was healed. So we have every right to believe for that. Well, Phil, what do you think is wrong? Well, I think we need to press in more and learn more. I don't have this whole thing figured out, but I'm going to press in with everything that I have because I want every person that I get to pray for, or I get to put my hands on to receive their healing right then. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> so let me ask you a question. What kind of wilderness experience are you having? I've heard people talk about, you know, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm in a wilderness experience. Okay, well, which wilderness experience are you going to experience? Because the Israelites' wilderness experience destroyed them, killed them. Remember, they all died in the wilderness. But Jesus' wilderness experience, he came out in victory and in power, right? Because he was anointed when he went in. And the Holy Spirit led him there. Remember, the Holy Spirit took him into the wilderness. And he was tested in the wilderness. All right. So Hebrews chapter 10, this will be my last scripture. Turn over there. Oh, I have that word God gave me. I didn't think I have it. So you guys want to know what God was sharing with me at three this morning? I wrote it down on the back of my notes. He said, when you give God leftovers or less than your best, it's like offering a lame sacrifice. That's another good place to say amen. Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> hope you guys don't get offended when I say stuff like that I'm just playing with you Hebrews chapter 10 look at verse 35 it says therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward don't cast away your confidence hold on to your confidence it's confidence in God right for for you have need of endurance. <laughs> I'm telling you, we, okay, so we went to New York and uh, Zach has some friends that live there and they invited us over. And, and so we went over and I mean, it was so cool. We rode the train in and we visited all of these places, but we literally, we saw everything that you can see by train and by foot in New York City. I mean, Times Square, Lady Liberty, uh, Ellis Island. I mean, we, we went everywhere. And we, when we got done, we had 30,000 steps. 30,000 steps. I don't know if you've done 30,000 steps in a while, but I was like, you know. And so Nicole and I are walking, but we're with a bunch of 20-year-olds, you know. And they have a different stride than we do you know and man they're going and they're just and we're keeping up with them keeping up with them and Nicole saying that she was with them the whole time no you weren't there were a few times you were back with me and uh, I don't think so <laughs> and so so we're walking you know and and there were a few times that Zach and Becca would turn around and say are you okay are you okay yeah I'm, I'm okay just you know I got a different pace than you right endurance we need endurance. He says, for you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. What kind of endurance is it talking about? It's talking about not being moved by what you see. Bill Johnson said this. He said, we are prone to discouragement that leads to unbelief whenever our attention is on what God isn't doing as opposed to what he is doing. When you're always looking at the negative you can't see the positive. How are you going to keep your faith? This is why I discourage people to, in watching the news. I'm sorry. I mean, you watch the news for an hour and every story is negative until you get to the last story on Friday, you know, because Friday's the weekend and everybody's happy on the weekend when really you should be happy on Monday. You should be happy on Tuesday, happy on Wednesday, come on. And even on Thursday. Never, you should be happy. But, and then they, they end that news story with a good, feel-good story. And it's like, that should have been the whole news. 
How about the whole news, the good story, and then maybe end with a, we need to pray about this. And so too many Christians are watching too many negative things. And what it's doing is it's not helping your faith. What helps your faith? It's reading the Bible, reading those good stories, reading about the things that God did and rejoicing in that and going, God, I'm just so thankful that what you did for them, you'll do for me. That when somebody else get, tells you a testimony and they talk about what God did in their life, that you hear their testimony and you go, man, Lord, thank you that what you did for them, what you did for Jacob, you're gonna do for me, right? What you did for Tammy, you're gonna do for me. What you did for Caleb and Susanna, you're going to do in my life. Oh man, that's good news. We, one of the first places I wanted to go in New York City was down to the 9-11 Memorial. You know, I just wanted to visit the place and be, uh, be there on location. And man, it just, we got tears in our eyes just thinking about, you know, what had transpired and all the stuff that had happened. And so we're leaving and we're walking a street right across the street from where the World Trade Center Memorial is. When you walk across the street, there's a place called St. Paul's Chapel. And it's a church. And you remember when the towers fell, there were all these buildings around it that collapsed too because it just compromised that whole, it was, man, it's huge buildings, you know, and it just brought down all these other buildings. When the smoke cleared, St. Paul's Chapel was still standing. And it's still there today. And that's the way you should be. That when everything else collapses around you, when everything else falls around you, you're still standing. Why? Because my faith is not in this economy. My faith is not in this government. My faith is not even in a new Christian leader coming back into power. My faith is in Jesus. And every knee will bow. On earth, in heaven. Every tongue will confess. Jesus is Lord. Psalm 23 se- or 27.3 says, Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, in this I will be confident. Man, I know where my help comes from. How about you? <laughs> Come on, Jesus. Woo! Yeah. So I, I just want to give you one more thing, and then we're going to pray. And that's, there's, there's a hindrance to hearing the voice of God. And that's a sin consciousness. It could be a sin consciousness from, you know, something that maybe even while I'm talking that you've been convicted in your heart over. And that, man, I just want you to know how easy that is to let go of and to get rid of. It's as simple as you and I, in the sincerity of our heart, turning from it and asking God to forgive us you know this is this is the prodigal son coming home really the prodigal son that story should be called the love of the father you know or something it should be about because that story is all about the father because what did the father do he's watching in the distance just waiting for his son to come across the horizon and he ran to his son and he welcomed him back powerful story sin consciousness so it could be from that or it could be from the sin a sin from the past that the enemy is still allowed to bring shame guilt condemnation into your life because you're holding on to something that's already been forgiven and that's that's not good when we know that we've been forgiven but yet we allow the enemy to come and to replay it in our mind and to show us over and over and over. What that tells me when that's happening in my life is I'm feeding on the wrong things. Because when I get in the Word and I listen to the Word and I I enjoy the audio Bible because I just like to listen to the same chapter over and over and over and over because I want it to get in me. I want to understand the Word of God at a greater level and when I'm doing that there's not time and there's not space and there's not room for the for the enemy to come and to just bombard me with negative thoughts or bring up my past that Jesus paid for when he paid for it that means it was erased 
And imagine you bringing your list to God and saying, God, you know, I'm so sorry about this. And and he's like, what? What are you sorry about? That wasn't you. I heard, yeah, oh my word. That would be like me holding up a two-week-old baby. Whenever you, when, when, when you repent of something and you ask God to forgive you, this baby has a bigger past than you do. That's huge. That's huge. Let me read a final scripture to you and then I want to pray. 1 John 3, 21 and 22. It says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. See, if your heart is being condemned by guilt, shame, condemnation, then you don't have confidence to come before God and to ask for forgiveness, to ask him to help you. You don't have confidence when you pray. This is why we need to let that go. and We need to allow the Holy Spirit to remind us who we are and our true identity is that I'm forgiven. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm, I am, (laughs) I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am now a child of the living God. I am a co-heir with Jesus. Man, look at that. So beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, if your heart does, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God and whatever we ask, we receive, whoa, from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Let me tell you, it's not about keeping commandments. Let me tell you what it's about. It's about you and I reading the Bible at face value and simply doing what it says. It's so simple. We're the ones that make it complicated. And the devil, and it's no wonder that people try to make it complicated because the enemy is the author of confusion. He loves it when you're confused. I mean, if, if you're confused, he's, he is overjoyed. And what's amazing is that the Bible is so simple. God has made it so simple for us that a child can understand it. 